the insane history of Chicago and plenty others. <laughs> this is so much fun. I'm going to share this with you. This, this is impossibility, man. Impossibility. So I'm reading my man, uh, Howdy Mikulski's book, uh, exposing, exposing the expositions, 1851 to 1915. And I'm just on the scratch the surface, a big fan of Howdy. Um, this book just, is freaking mind boggling in terms of you just, you sit, you'll, if you're interested in history and you're a conspiracy theorist, i.e. the history we've been told doesn't make any sense. This is the book for you, man. I'm telling you, you'll go down. Just, uh, I'm literally on page 38. And I just, every single, like every single sentence, I'm like, oh man, I got to look up this myself. So I'm reading about the Chicago expositions right now. I'm not even going to get into that in this video. I'm just going to show you the insane history of Chicago. All right, so we're going to look at 1830, Chicago, 1832. Let's check a look. Look at this. There's not, not like just a swamp, a couple rivers. Uh, but look at that. That's at Wolf's Point. Apparently, Wolf's Point now is uh, quite prominent in Chicago. The evolution of Wolf's Point buildings. We got some guys, some Indians. You know, just nothing fancy there. You know, it's 1832. We got, look at this. We got some, I don't know, uh, farmers or whatever, you know, trappers. Nothing fancy there. I wonder if there's a good evolution of it. Kind of shows how it starts being built up, I guess. Anyway, so that's Wolf's Point in Chicago, 1832. Fast forward till 1858. <laughs> this is so insane. Alexander Hessler climbs a courthouse. Fast forward from what we just saw <laughs> to this. All right, and we're going to see the panorama. All right, uh, view from the courthouse, Alexander Hess, Hessler for photograph in 1858. We can see the panorama. This this is just, in, look at this, man. This is insane. We got the Mercantile College. Um, I'm going to show you because there's a, there's like no humans actually in this other than I saw a guy on it. And we're going to come down here and we're going to see, you see all these horses and stuff. Can't tell if they're moving, but you don't, you see some barrels. You don't see anyone in them. It's weird. Like you don't see any humans, but I think I saw a guy right there. If memory, there's a guy on a oh right there, yeah right there. That's the only human we see in all these pictures. We got Fex, Fesswick and Company job printers. We just got tons of. Look, I mean, look at all these buildings. They're all in brick and marble, glass. I mean, and if we go back here, where look, I mean, you got a little bit of trees here, not much, not much. I get these all drawings, but where'd all the where where'd all the wood come? Where would all this stuff come from? Where'd it come from? I mean, look at this. Look at all these buildings. We got Sproul and Chapaton, Mammoth, something. Where would all these come from in twenty five years? Give me a freaking break. We got, what's this guy here? Bryant and Stratton's Mercantile College. And that's just one. We got tons of different panoramas. Well, let's just look at this one right here. This is, I don't even know what this is here. Look, look at that. Do we got people down there? No, no people. Where are all the people? You got, I mean, look at dirt, rock building, rock roads. You know what I'm saying? That horse and buggies got, where, where, where is all this? Where does all this stuff come from? It doesn't make any sense. It's crazy. Crazy. Then we go down to, uh, let's look at, oh, right here. Check this one out. Look, what? what? <laughs> Come on, man. Come on, man. I mean, look, dirt roads, no people, horse and buggies. The only thing, the, a huge spire there. I mean, a few trees in there. What? What? <laughs> Uh, so then I want to just read to you from from this right quick. All right. They, uh, <laughs> that's why I got to show you. Oh, so let me see if I can't find the picture. So reading from uh, Howdy here, he goes, uh, that is a massive amount of building in less than 20 years. I'm counting five major towers similar to cathedrals, several other smaller ones, and a population of about 2,000 people. All right. Where did all, uh, this is from 1830 to uh, 1853. I showed, so from 1830 to 1853, well, let me just show you here real quick. 
This is just a drawing from uh, 1853. I think it's a drawing. It's a bird, and you can see a cathedral here, but not very many trees, are there? Kind of weird. You can see the train right there. Massive amounts of building, but uh, that's even in 1853. Even that, you're like, what? Especially when you come here, you're like, that. This is in 1858. What? There's another one. Eh, it just seems awful weird to me, man. From what it was, just literally a sleepy. I mean, look at all that stuff. And this isn't. So let's just go back to what Howdy was saying. It's because it's incredible. He goes. How was all this built in just 20 years from a population of 2,000 in 1832? Where did the building materials come from? How did the materials get in with only dirt roads to move what would be massive amounts of stone and brick? I can say stone and brick as the photos that we just showed you from the 19, 1858 panorama show the downtown with almost no wood buildings at all. Thus, the fire story gets harder to explain. Brick and stone is a much longer building process, and the size just cannot be built up in 20 years. All right, but that is not the real strange part. How about the story that they lifted? Yes, lifted up all of the buildings from the street level in the next 10 years. This is insane. The history basically states that because Chicago was built on a swamp and had poor drainage, for it had no high ground compared to the Lake Edge, the, it led to standing water, which which created epidemics of typhoid, dysentery, and uh, cholera. Cholera. Uh, Paul Johnson, in the history of the American people, said, "Quote: The city was built in a low lying area, subject to flooding. In 1856, the city council decided that the entire city should be elevated four to five feet high by using a newly available jacking up process. In one instance, the five stories." story Briggs Hotel weighing 22,000 tons was lifted while it continued to operate. Johnson reminded everybody that such a feat could not have happened in Europe and wrote, this astounding feat was a dramatic example of American determination and ingenuity based on the conviction that anything material is possible. So let's look at this. This is insane. This is the Briggs uh, Hotel. They're literally... <laughs> <laughs> in 18, what, 1856, they're literally lifting it up, literally lifting it up five feet off the ground. <laughs> These guys are, I mean, uh, there's a drawing. It, it doesn't make any sense. They literally, the city was built, every building, the city council decided that the entire should, city should be elevated. If we look, we're, I mean, look at this. Again, this is 1858. But these did not come from 1856 to 1858. That, no, these were built before 1856 when the city council said we had to lift the whole doggone thing. It doesn't make any sense. So when Wikipedia says in January of 1858, the first masonry building in Chicago was to be raised and not raised, tore down, raised, literally lifted. A four-story, 70-foot, 750-ton uh, brick structure situated at the northeast corner of Randolph and Dearborn Street was lifted on 200 jack screws to his new grade, which was six, point, six feet two inches higher than before, without the slightest injury to the building. Before the year was out, they were lifting brick buildings more than 100 feet long. Yet this was just a warm-up. In 1860, they raised up half a city block on Lake Street. A solid masonry row of shops, offices, printers, 320 feet long, comprising brick and stone buildings some four stories high. In five days, the entire assembly was elevated basically five feet in the air by a team consisting of 600 men using 6,000 jack screws. The spectacle drew crowds of thousands who were on the final day permitted to walk the old ground among the jacks. Basically, is going back to Howdy, is the claim that the whole of downtown, the whole, the street sidewalks and buildings were raised on hydraulic jacks or jack screws while the people were still living and working in the buildings. <laughs> they didn't even send them away for a few days. They just let them walk right up. <laughs> this is crazy. It doesn't make sense. Think about this, man. I mean, so again, we're going to go back to this. All these buildings right here had to, because this ha started happening in 18, the 1856 when the city council said, let's do it. All these buildings had to be, I mean, all of them uh, had to be raised. Or, I'm going to go back here. Let me get rid of this guy. Let me get rid of this guy for a second. All of these buildings, this church, everything, 
Ha Look, all that stuff. I mean, come on, <laughs> that didn't happen. Oh, it's, look at this. I mean, it, yeah, <laughs> it, it, it only gets better. Some guy named Bancroft. This work was in truth a necessity in order to provide a thorough system of sewage and to avoid the malarial fevers and other forms of sickness caused by the low swampy site. Uh, a site which for years after Chicago had become a thriving commercial town. Well, it looks like it was a thriving commercial town before that. I mean, look at that. <laughs> uh, um, uh, was a little bit of a quagmire, quagmire where as one of her citizens, Chicago citizens remarked, the one unequaled universal inevitable thing about this place was mud. To accomplish the task, the streets were filled in and by means of jack screws, screws worked by steam power, not in the large, not only in the largest dwellings, but the largest buildings, business buildings and business blocks, churches, theaters, hotels, edifices of every kind were raised for the required elevation um, and without being vacated, <laughs> whether used for businesses or residential purposes. Then the workers diverted the entire river system by an extraordinary feat of engineering, was made to change its course. <laughs> At a distance of two and a half miles from the lakefront with the Illinois and uh, Michigan canal, canal, which was uh, much deepened to draw the waters of the lake, this all happened in the 1850s and 60s. Literally 30 years before, this is what Chicago was. Uh, it just it doesn't make any sense. And we're going to show you, this is what, well, I I guess I, you saw what it was here. Um, well, let me find it again. Here. That, that makes no sense. Literally in less than 30 years. I, and don't forget, Chicago's population, by the way, let's go. 1840, it only had 4,000 people. In 1850, it had less than 30,000 people. In 1860, 112,000 people. That's it. I mean, this is insanity. And we're just finished off here with my man. Either this is a work that rivals building the Giza pyramids, or this is just a giant fairy tale. I don't see the in-between. I, I completely agree. This doesn't make any sense. First, to build an entire city on a swamp, uh, Washington, D.C., with giant buildings that would require massive foundations, only to realize, oh, gee, we're on a swamp. Better raise them all up. So raise all the buildings, and in fact, the streets as well, divert the rivers and build new canals with less than 100,000 people. That's just, that's just, I mean, let's see, half that were men. So 50,000 men. Does anyone believe this? Try to think of doing that today. It would be a major undertaking that might not even be possible, even with all modern machinery. Yet Chicago could do this in 1858. Go ask your local contractor to raise up, say, a small city like South Bend, Indiana. See what they tell you. Besides, I've only found two photographs of this work being done. Mostly, all that exists are only poorly made drawings. They had photography at this time, as we just saw. There are a lot of photographs from the 1850s. Floods in California and Civil War dead, and many very average things are photographed. Would not something like this have been uh, interest to be photographed for human history? Only one of the photographs I can find, he, he finds, I'm not going to look to it, but it just doesn't make sense, my friends. So then we have the Great Chicago Fire, just a few years later, of the raising of those brick and marble buildings. And yet that killed, uh, burned the whole city down, essentially. It killed it for three days in 1871. It killed approximately 300 people, destroyed three and a half square miles, including over 17,000 structures, and left more than 100,000 homeless. Uh, remember the O'Leary? We talked about O'Leary's cow or something like that. Um, the fire is claimed to start by 8.30 p.m. in around a small barn belonging to the O'Leary family that bordered an alley behind something like that. Yeah. Um, and so check this out. Once the fire had ended, the smoldering, smoldering remains were still too hot for a survey of the damage to be completed for many days. Eventually, the city determined that the fire destroyed an area of about four miles long. All right, uh, let's see. Destroyed were more than 73 miles of roads, 120 miles of sidewalk, lampposts, 17,500 buildings, and massive amounts of uh, dollars and property. A third of the city's valuation was gone. General Philip Sheridan came to the, quickly to the aid of the city and was placed in charge. <laughs> oh, my goodness. It was put under martial law. Never did, deep, never did deeper emotions of joy overcome me uh, 
Thank God those most dear to me were safe as well when the first regiment of Chicago volunteers came. All right, so check this out. Um, now, that was in 1871. What's this? Oh, the Chicago Exposition uh, in 1893. Look at that thing, dude. Look at that thing. The Columbian Expo. I mean, it's just three years later, uh, 20 years later. And what happened to the exposition buildings? Massive amounts of building. Chicago's exposition, exp, exhibition uh, was a 690-acre site built supposedly from scratch in two years, 18 years after the Great Fire, uh, which included all the landscaping, planning, construction, all the canals dug, all the roads and sidewalks put in, and all the midway rides up and running. What sort of planning does that require? Even if you claim to have 100,000 workers, but Chicago claimed to only use 40,000, who was setting up the feeding of them every day? Where did all the bathrooms go? How did the materials get to the site? Where did they sleep? There's no machines, trucks, or electrical power. That's 690 acres of not just buildings, but monster buildings. Look at the manufacturer's building by itself is at least 30 acres. So let's take a look at it. The there's the manufacturer's building. 30 acres. Look at that thing. My man Howdy goes into uh, when he talks to a uh, contractor he had. They said, yeah, if I had a 50,000 guys, all the machines I wanted, an unlimited budget of hundreds of millions of dollars, I might be able to do this in 10 years in today's technology. If you want to go into it, you should. Uh, There's just the Columbian Exposition of 1893. It's just, it's insane. I'm not going to get, we're already 18, 16 minutes here, but man, just ended this video with a, uh, with what Howdy says, no World's Fair can be complete without fires destroying many of the buildings, and Chicago is no exception. The first fire took place during the fair in the cold storage building of July 17th, 1893. Um, it is just, it just goes on and on how the fires, and, and don't forget, they built this in two years, by all that stuff in two years, in Chicago winters. I think Chicago winters are pretty cold, by the way. Pretty doggone cold. Uh, it's just, it's crazy. It's crazy. I, I cannot recommend this book enough, man. Um, there are a couple of typos in here, and it's, uh, you know, don't let it, a couple, you know, C-A-N-T instead of C-A-N apostrophe T, whatever, man. I just, it doesn't matter. The, the, I mean, because there are some people who say, oh, I wish, if you look at the reviews, you're going to see some people, I wish you would have uh, spell checked or something like that. And, like, it's just, it's small potatoes, man. <laughs> But there's pictures in here. It's such a freaking great book. And uh, he's got a uh, Howdy Mikulski Talks. Um, this is his YouTube channel. And uh, I tell you, this is nuts. And, and uh, so I would go to his, if you like history at all, and Howdy Talks about John Levi or Levi's channel. I'm watching this right now. The Ellis Island Experience Beyond What We Know. Uh, John's just got, this guy just kicks ass, dude. Uh, just He's got just tons of of stuff that's just it doesn't make sense in our historical realm that we're living in and uh how he touches on i think it's howdy mikulski talks let's see yeah so here's howdy mikulski talks um just lots of interesting stuff man and i uh this guy i mean he it just is very interesting you know do i agree i have to always say you know i don't agree with everything he says i don't i just i don't it's just it, it's int i'm of interest in a contrarian, not in a contrarian so much, a different perspective than what we've been told. And if I can find a different perspective from what we've been told, even if he has some thoughts that don't jive with me, that's okay. It's interesting to me. You know what I'm saying? I think if memory serves, I think Howdy lives like Norway or something like that with his wife and he's farming out there. I can't remember. But, uh, you know, uh, highly recommend it. I'll put a link in the show notes for the Amazon book if you want to get it. And if you're get, this is not something you want on Kindle. You want a physical copy of this because there's so much notes you're going to take so much highlights and stuff um of course if you use my link i get that sweet sweet amazon money so use my link and buy your book and get us some history we'll talk to you thanks now